In 1952, it was quite common to be wearing some sort of face covering and protect the wearer from what they were inhaling. But unlike a virus, the dangers they were protecting against were much more visible. Today, we will be discussing the Great Smog of London. 2022 marked 70 years since that infamous event in December of 1952. But let's first backtrack a little. What is smog? Essentially, smog is a mix of fog and smoke, and in this case, a very deadly mix. With major population increases, London has continuously suffered with bad air quality. Complaints have even been raised dating back to even the 1600s, enough for King James I to enact some restrictions on coal burning, ones that never actually led to any significant change. Come the 1700s and the Industrial Revolution, condition of the air pollution got significantly worse. From exponential increase in population and heating homes, to major increase in factory furnaces. London's smog problem became known as pea soup fog for the consistency, sickly colour in the air. There were further attempts to control pollution. In 1850s, the Smoke Nuisance Abatement Act, and in 1891, the Public Health Act, but they had little lasting effect, and there was little reason to deter the industry from the employment and profit it brought. And in the time, there was little other option but to burn the cheapest of coal to heat one's home. So there were recorded significant instances of a terrible smog. December of 1813, December of 1873, in which the death rate rose 40% above normal levels, January 1880, February 1882, December 1891, December 1892, and November of 1948. Worse afflicted was typically the East End, where population density was worse, and the area was low-lying, away from cool breezes. Thus we come to 1952, just seven years after the war, and the country and city were still struggling to recover and recently the city had replaced its electric trams for diesel fuelled buses. You may have noticed the pattern forming of smog instances, all occurring over the winter months, and that's exactly what happened once more. Between Friday the 5th of December and Tuesday the 9th of December in 1952, circumstances collided. The natural cold air rolled in but trapped the warmer air from the burning of pollutants. The lowland of the city meant for the lack of wind, and because it was cold outside, to keep warm, households were burning even more low quality coal than usual. When the chemical pollutants mixed with the trapped water in the fog, it turned into a very thick, smelly, dirty, yellow and brown smog, covering a 30 mile wide area of the city, around 100 to 200 metres deep. When burning fossil fuels, we know they are bad and dirty, but its pollutants go up into the atmosphere. Now imagine they went down, and you had to breathe all of that in, and walk through that smoke, and mix it with a bit of thick fog so it doesn't even dissipate. The city's reliance on burning fuel meant that they were constantly pumping warm pollutants into the stale air, making things even worse. During the worst of the fog, it was reported that a thousand tons of smoke particles, 2000 tons of carbon dioxide, 140 tons of hydrochloric acid, and 14 tons of fluorine compounds were pumped into the air each day. Now, I'm not a scientist, but I'm guessing that is probably quite bad. According to witnesses, visibility was reduced to just one foot in some areas, and many could not see across the street. And even worse, apparently even sunlight was not able to penetrate this smog. All movement around the city was dangerous. It caused a major collision between two trains. Bus conductors led their buses with flashlights down the streets, and headlights were used in the middle of the day. And even then, many cars were abandoned in the streets. Flights and trains were eventually cancelled, even boats on the river felt it too dangerous to continue. Even ambulances could not navigate the streets, and many had to find their own way to a hospital if it was an emergency. All transportation was ground to a halt, or at least a snail's pace, except for the London Underground, which operated as usual. 
The smog was not seen as a big deal until, of course, the football was cancelled, as fans couldn't even see a goal even if there was one. As the fog got far worse over the weekend, people were advised to stay home, especially children, who it was feared would get lost. In a tale as old as time, just like during those blackouts of World War II, when visibility got worse, crime got easier. Looting, burglaries, assaults and theft all increased. There was simply no escape from the smog. In fact, it even made its way indoors. Plays, concerts and movie theatres had to shut their doors as audiences reported difficulty seeing the stage and the screens in front of them. One person even sent in evidence of this to the Ministry of Health in January of 1953, a white piece of paper which had been left on their desk. The circular blotches where an ink pot sat protecting the paper and the yellow stains that were created from the air. It was known at this point the effect pollution could have on health, with rising respiratory problems and people complaining of cough fits and blindness through the thickest of the smog. It proved deadly for many elderly, young children and those with pre-existing respiratory problems. This included heavy smokers, which was very common in the 50s. Early figures estimate the immediate death toll at 4,000 people. The death rate in the East End increased by nine times its typical in that weekend and remained above normal well into 1953. It is reported a further 8,000 people died in the following year from respiratory problems. And with ongoing effects, experts estimate that this great smog may have claimed as many as 12,000 lives in total. It was not only human lives either. Birds losing their clear vision would crash into buildings, and cattle around the city were reported to have choked to death, with some farmers apparently creating gas masks for their prized cows from grain sacks soaked in whiskey. At first there was little reaction from Londoners, as they thought this was just another average fog that would move along quickly. And eventually it did, just five days later. On December 9th, a cool breeze finally pushed all of the smog out of the city. Everything went back to normal, and seemingly nothing had happened at all. Panic didn't set in until months later, when death rates were realised and health effects were lingering. A chief medical statistician noticed that this incident attained death rates similar to that experienced during the 1854 cholera epidemic and influenza of 1918-19. But as it was happening, there was little understanding of just how deadly this incident was. It wasn't until the doctors, undertakers and florists started comparing their tales of the weekend that most people even realised its effect. Some, though, still accepted this deadly smog as just something they had to deal with if they wanted to live in a city so populated and industrialised. This is the mindset of assuming for the government profit and employment comes above public health and that these conditions were not going to change. Luckily, that was not the case. As I said, there had been slight attempts to curve the air pollution in London, but they never really amounted to anything. But the Great Smog of 1952 was a good catalyst for real change. Not that it meant immediate effect, but it was a good start for the changing opinions about the priority of air quality over the demands of industry. Just like today, it is easier to notice or pay attention if you are able to see a problem. Like during the pandemic, we saw some clear examples of how our restricted movement had some great effects around the planet. Equally, it was pretty hard to ignore the smog when you literally have to walk right through it. Sir Hugh Beaver was appointed as chair of a committee on air pollution from 1953 to 54. This committee recommended ways to improve London's air, including making industrial smoke cleaner and regulated, as well as, on a domestic level, changing the way that we heat houses. Although controversially, they suggested moving to smokeless fuels like electricity and gas, which in turn burned coal to produce, meaning they proposed simply moving the smoke pollution elsewhere outside the city. 
The Minister of Health also enacted a new regulation prescribing face masks to all patients suffering with pre-existing breathing and respiratory problems. Now, I don't want to give all the credit, it still took four years to get anything pushed through the government. In 1956, the Clean Air Act was passed. This introduced smoke control areas, only permitting smokeless fuel. This also gave the authority to local councils to make their own smoke-free zones. New furnaces being installed had to be smokeless. The burning of black smoke from private chimneys was prohibited, and in efforts to stop reliance on coal for heating houses, there were grants for homeowners to convert from coal burning into other alternative systems such as oil, natural gas and electricity. This did lead to a huge reduction in smoke output across the city, and specifically sulphur dioxide emissions. But the full transition took years, and unfortunately changes didn't come quick enough. More and more occurrences of pockets of bad smog still kept appearing. From the 2nd to the 5th of December 1957, there were reported 760 to 1,000 deaths from another smog incident. And another deadly smog formed in 1962, which killed 750 people. Over a decade later, after the first, another act in 1968 made burning black smoke illegal, except in very few circumstances. Slowly but surely, smog in London became less frequent. The use of central heating became widespread, and modern developments offered new options and smokeless technology took over. And slowly, factories and such industries migrated out of the city, to places with less restrictions on their pollutant output. The Great Smog of 1952 was a big wake-up call to the deadly effects of society's reliance on air pollutants. Similarly, the Clean Air Act really was a major swing in the right direction for the nation to realise priorities had to change. It also marked a change in government intervention into regards of public health and private households. In 1993, a new Clean Air Act was implemented, which extended the legislation. More recently, London created a low emission zone in 2008, creating a toll to drive into central London. In 2019, made the area an ultra-low emission zone. And as of 2021, this zone was expanded to 18 times what the 2008 zone covered, nearly half of London's population. But of course, we may always be asking, is this enough? Perhaps just because deadly events like the smog of 1952 don't occur quite as often, and we cannot quite see the danger so vividly, doesn't mean that we're all in the clear. London's air quality is still really bad, and it is reported that there are almost 4,000 premature deaths in London caused by this per year. Hopefully we can still keep pushing in the right direction, but hopefully we will never see a return to the situation as Londoners found themselves in having to cancel a football game because of weather. I hope you enjoyed this video, and let me know if you knew anything about this before, or any cool stories to share from those who lived through it. I'll see you next time, and goodbye for now.